Okay, it's about four o'clock and I know this room is a little off the beaten path in this hotel. Um, it was chosen for obvious reasons, which is the bright light in the speaker's eyes at the dais. Um, but given that it is late in the day and I know that come 5.30 today, everyone will have priorities that do not involve this room, um, I think we'll go ahead and get started and others can join us as they uh, have the opportunity uh, to come in and do so. Everybody having a good conference so far? Enjoy, enjoying the foggy gray weather? I, I was telling Steve earlier, I live in Phoenix. I come to Seattle fairly often. I am always disappointed because most of the time when I come here, I bring the sunshine with me. It's sunny, it's clear, uh, it's warm. The natives are just thrilled. I'm so depressed. Um, so I'm really glad to see the fog today. and. Um, I'm glad that Seattle's living up to that reputation for this business. So um, the subject this afternoon we have is on economic game changers. And for those of us who work in various aspects of public transportation and connecting transportation and land use for livable communities, one of the big emphases that we always have in making those investments in infrastructure is the fact that making that investment can help create and support jobs. Um, but in oftentimes in many communities, when we talk about economic development, when we talk about creating jobs, what are we focused on? We're focused on attracting the next Amazon, the next Google, the next major employer that's going to create thousands of jobs in any location. But obviously, as many of us know, when you look at economic development, there are far fewer of those opportunities than there are the opportunities to grow businesses of much different sizes with much different emphases and with much different benefits in terms of what they bring to a community. So the panel that we have here with us today is here to talk about jobs. And they're here to talk about the types of jobs that are being developed through investments in transit in livable communities within their communities and how they are working to connect jobs in their communities to transit and to the support of economic development and investments in transit infrastructure. So we have a panel here today of four folks who are here to join us. Um, our first speaker uh, to the, um, excuse me, far left is Mickey Langston um, from Denver, Colorado. And Mickey is here to talk about her passion for building livable communities and working with small businesses to help them understand the value of the investment in transit and how they can benefit from that. Uh, sitting to Mickey's uh, left is Claudia Lima. Uh, Claudia runs LISC in Los Angeles and as a part of her work is developing a holistic community planning approach to help connect jobs and transit through the investments that are being made in the Los Angeles region. To her left, uh, Andy Hesnes, who is from Minneapolis. Uh, Andy has a background in dealing in construction and real estate development with a lot of experience in the area of affordable and mixed income housing and has also been done work in the past with the Native American community around the Franklin Light Rail Station in the Minneapolis area. And then finally, from our host city, Steve Johnson, who is the director of the Office of Economic Development, excuse me, for the city of Seattle, and res is responsible for all the economic development activities that are part of the city's core business of its growth and growing in the future. Um, we'll take each of their presentations. I'd ask if we can hold uh, questions to the end, but hopefully as you go through the conversation, if you have some great questions you'd like to save and share with them, we'd like to do everything we can to keep them here till 5.30. Um, we hope you'll join us till 5.30 as well. Mickey? Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Mickey Langston. I am co-founder and executive director of the Mile High Business Alliance based in Denver, Colorado. Uh, our organization is a nonprofit membership-based uh, business association that works primarily with locally owned businesses, um, most of them located in the Denver metro region, but throughout Colorado. The mission of our organization specifically is to build a more connected, healthy, and resilient local economy. So there's a lot of kinds of work that we do directly with those businesses and then in collaboration with um, others throughout our community to answer this question of how do we build an economy that really works and what are the component parts of that. 
Uh, and that's just a little bit of context about where I'm coming from because I'm not a developer, I'm not a planner, I have very little experience in transportation. Um, my expertise is really around specifically working with small and locally owned businesses within our community and bringing those relationships to questions like how do we strengthen um, our economy using transit infrastructure. And so um, the work I'm going to tell you about is um, specifically via Mile High Connects, which is a collaborative based in Denver that brings together foundation partners and uh, economic development, uh, along with social justice and, and uh, other um, uh, equity concerned organizations to look at how can we leverage all of the mm, investment that's being done in the Denver metro area with fast tracks and our huge expansion of our light rail and other transit options. How do we leverage that in order to create uh, good jobs for people who are middle skilled workers? Um, and so we define middle skilled workers as those that have more than a high school diploma but less than a college degree. Um, so specifically connecting those folks with public transit to good jobs, what are the ways that we do that? Uh, so Mile High Connects as a collaborative is looking in a lot of ways at how do we leverage this investment to benefit more people in the area. And then the jobs working group is specifically answering that question of increasing good jobs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've done. I won't give too many details about the projects, um, but I do want to share some of the big findings that we um, specifically found in our work with small businesses and how do we connect small businesses to transit? How do we increase jobs of those businesses? Um, and then I'm going to talk about the, the future. So the projects that we're working on now, um, how, how can we use the things we're learning to leverage and inform um, new strategies and policy and investment in not only just our transit infrastructure, but our, our entire economic and community infrastructure as a whole. So a little bit of context about Denver. Um, like many US cities, Denver has become a very car-centric place and is now doing the work of uh, bringing in more multimodal uh, means of transportation in the community. Um, but the culture is still very car oriented. And part of that just has to do with the space itself. It's the expansive west. So there's lots of room to build um, things like roads. Um, another thing about Colorado to know is that it really is a small business state. And people love to talk about small businesses and how much they love them. But um, in the state of Colorado in a recent 10 year period, all of the net job gain in the entire state came from firms that have fewer than 20 employees. Um, and that's compared to all of the job growth and loss based on firms um, of different sizes. So the big companies certainly made some new jobs, but they also ended a lot of jobs. So if you look at um, the net increase over time in the state of Colorado, it's persistently small businesses that are the ones cr creating new jobs in the community. So that's some of the context that we were coming from in the jobs working group and saying, well, what is it that, first of all, what are the good jobs? Where are new jobs being created that would serve these middle skilled workers? Um, what can we see in terms of workforce development investment and how does that prepare the workforce for taking on these new jobs? And most importantly, especially for me, what does it take for those businesses to be able to create and sustain and then grow new jobs in those sectors? Um, another task of the working group that we've really been looking at is what, so what is small business relationship to transit? So when you have a group of people who are passionate about transit, you are going to make a lot of assumptions, including that everyone is passionate about transit. <laughs> but then you go and you work in the community and people have other concerns and issues that may not translate into that same kind of passion. So how do we communicate the value of transit development to these businesses who are providing employment? Um, and then finally, what is the what are the things that are available if our task is to support these businesses who are providing new economic opportunity? How is it that we actually support them? So a lot of the work that my organization has done as part of the jobs working group is trying to understand specifically in the Denver area, what is it that those businesses really need right now so that we aren't just having theoretical conversations in planning meetings about what it takes for a small business to be successful. 
And that really gets to um, some our first main finding, which is that business building strong businesses really takes more than just capital. So part of the work of the working group looked at all of the kinds of financial capital that's available to invest in small businesses. Um, but from both sides, whether it was small businesses talking about it or these capital providers, what was really clear is that just putting money into a business is not sufficient for building a healthy business and therefore jobs. Um, so one of the challenges that finance um, organizations and, and even you know, micro lending organizations, the whole spectrum of capital for business is finding is that they have businesses who are unprepared for capital investment. So you might have funds that are available, but if you don't have the businesses who are ready to really leverage that effectively, then you then there's a gap in being able to translate that into new economic opportunity. So um, this is actually an example of one of the organizations that we identified who is providing much needed business development or um, in the nonprofit speak technical assistance to small businesses that um, are either getting started in the community or expanding. Uh, so this is Mikasa Resource Center. These are the types of programs that they actually provide to people in the community. They focus on uh, primarily women and Latino owned businesses, but they work with any small business that wants to leverage their programming. And you can see that um, when you're working on business development, it isn't just about the business planning and the capital piece, although those are really important. Um, so in the Denver area, what we found is we have more than 80 organizations that are business support organizations. So they provide um, to small businesses from a nonprofit place um, business development support. And that includes everything from tiny merchant groups that are vo volunteer run by the businesses doing work in their own neighborhood, all the way up to the big small business development um, network that's funded via SBA and other funds. So there's a whole spectrum of organizations. And we're putting more than $40 million a year into these kinds of programs just in the Denver area. Um, but the, the challenges that we lack right now are really strategic infrastructure for those organizations. So you have 80 organizations working with um, a full spectrum of resources, most of whom don't have a lot to work with, and they're all concerned with the same thing, which is we need to help, we need to help small businesses be successful. And we know, based on our assumptive formula, that if we help those small businesses, that translates to greater economic opportunity and well-being for the community. Um, so what we've really been getting to is a collaborative, and this is happening in places all over, not just in Denver, but recognizing that what we need for small businesses to be successful is really an ecosystem um, inside of which those businesses are really nurtured and can be successful. But that takes, um, obviously, doing that kind of work. Um, another finding is that well, the question that we had was, how is it that we can get these businesses to pay better wages and more benefits? So this is, this is a crazy graph, I, I know. But what I, <laughs> what I like about it is that it makes it really evident um, that as businesses increase their revenue, they increase the benefits that are provided to their employees. Uh, and that seems like a very obvious and logical statement, but being in a lot of these conversations with social justice organizations who don't understand what it takes to operate a business, there's often a lack of understanding of what it is that translates into higher wages and better benefits. That you know businesses are working with limited resources, and that those are a, that's a big investment and commitment on their part. And so often there's this question swirling around of, well, what does it take for us to make businesses do this? And um, while I think there are some businesses that are so disconnected from the social concern and so motivated by the profit concern that there may be opportunities for us to insist as a community on some basic um, things for workers. Most of the companies that we surveyed, so this came from um, us surveying 112 small businesses in the community, as they increase in revenue, um, they increase their benefits significantly. And so what we found is um, when an organization is making less than 100K in revenue, 85% uh, of those businesses don't provide any benefits, which is understandable, it's only $100,000 a year in revenue, that's not a lot to work with. Um, but the next jump, if they are making more than $100,000, 
um, from 100 up to a million, then it's really only about 26 to 28 percent of those businesses that don't provide any benefits to their employees. And once they get to the point of making more than a million dollars in revenue, only 4.6 percent of those organizations don't offer benefits to their employees. So it doesn't necessarily require that we legislate or demand that those businesses provide something, especially when they're small um, community-based organizations that have to see their employees every day. So recognizing that as businesses grow in their capacity, they're going to follow with uh, better paying jobs and more benefits for their employees. What that means to an organization like mine is that our job is to increase their capacity. So how do we get a business to make more, more revenue so that they can adequately sustain and nurture their employees? Um, another finding was related to how businesses relate to transit. So we asked them a lot of questions about it, but what it really came down to that was interesting to me is that business owners see transit as a benefit from the customer connection side. So a lot of the businesses, most especially retailers, could see increasing transit means that I have more people coming to my door. And that's obviously a business benefit. Uh, most of the business owners saw no connection to employee benefit when it comes to transit. And so uh, I think if we want to increase employee use of transit in a small business or in a community setting, there's another leverage point that we have to deal with, which is really about creating transit programs that are affordable and accessible to small businesses and their employees. So one of the things that happens now in Denver, um, we have through our regional transportation district uh, transit passes and programs that are available to employers, but they're really designed structurally to benefit and work specifically with large companies and anchor institutions. So it isn't a rule, you, you don't have to be a large business to be able to take advantage of them, um, but they don't make it easy for small businesses and there isn't much of an economic imperative for them to do so. So oftentimes when, when we as community leaders are trying to put these pieces together and understand, well, how do we increase ridership and increase access to transit? One of the places for us to look is um, not just the individual's relationship to that, but what does it mean um, for them in their employment situation? And uh, if the employer doesn't see a benefit and it doesn't actually save them any money, now it's completely left to the employee uh, to take advantage of that. So I think there's opportunities for us to specifically look at how can small businesses um, work more collaboratively with regional transportation districts to make sure that we're offering something that's really accessible and affordable. The thing is that um, this really takes political will. So um, anytime we're, we're building or changing or doing something new in our communities, it requires that we challenge the places we've come from and our assumptions about what it is that you know, uh, is possible or um, to not just take, well, this is how it's always been done as the answer. Uh, and that's true about economic development and transit development as well. So one of the things that we found is Lots of conversation is now happening around affordable housing with transit development. And that's been the, the result of a, a lot of effort by a lot of people to make sure that we aren't just like putting in new infrastructure and not accounting for the impact that that's having on the community. But that often doesn't happen uh, when it comes to economic development. So people think about affordable housing, but they don't necessarily think about how is this new transit infrastructure going to change the landscape for these existing businesses. And that really gets to some of the projects that we're doing moving forward. So um, there are three main uh, collaboratives that I want to point to and leave you with um, that we're, are in process now. One is work that's happening in a neighborhood in Denver. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Denver, but um, there, yeah, hi. <laughs> there is a, a neighborhood in Denver called Sun Valley um, that now has a transit stop that is also the, um, the highest concentration of people living in poverty in the entire state. Um, and so it's the site of the original public housing in Denver. And what's interesting about this neighborhood is that so much of the land is owned by our housing authority, by our public, well, public quasi public utility, um, as well as some other landowners. So there's this huge opportunity for redevelopment of this pretty centrally located neighborhood. Um, and there's recognition by folks in the community that if we just go in and do this standard cookie cutter, let's just scrape everything that was there and build all of this nice mixed use retail and 
um, interesting apartments, that it's going to have a significant impact on the people who already live there, as well as on the strange, eclectic mix of businesses that are still um, in existence in this area. So we're not working on the housing side. There are other partners in Mile High Connects who are actually dealing more with community engagement of these folks who've been living there. Um, but we're, we are reaching out to those small business owners and saying, what are the opportunities for you to expand your business? Um, there's about 200 firms that exist in this neighborhood, and most of them are in the categories of industries of businesses that we identified as potential growth opportunities for good jobs. So we've been going out to those businesses and finding out more about um, what are the potential opportunities for investing in, expanding, and strengthening those existing businesses instead of only thinking, back to what you were saying, only thinking of who is it that we bring into this spot. And that's, I think, really a gap for a lot of communities who are trying to do meaningful development work. Um, one of the things that we need um, in terms of that project is obviously we have to finish it. So we'll be complete with that by the end of this year and we'll be able to um, provide some meaningful input into how the city and its partners are really looking at economic development opportunities. Um, but what that will take, even if we come up with something brilliant, is the ability to really um, shift the way that we're thinking about economic development away from big corporations to these small businesses that you know might be able to have a deeper impact. Um, another component of our work that's expanding now is looking at this, this uh, ecosystem of small business development resources that are available. So we did this preliminary survey that helped us really see more of the landscape uh, and through a grant from the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation that work is continuing this year. Uh, and so the question that we're trying to answer with that is we have all of these organizations that are spending money on business support, but how do we know that they're effective? And who is it that's more effective at what pieces? And most importantly, how do we move forward as a community of organizations that are strategically and effectively building and strengthening the kinds of businesses that we need? And what we really need for that is, is the implementation, um, is the partnership and the resources to say, here's who's good at what things, and now here's how we're going to effectively communicate and plan strategically so that our work is is most effective. And really, I think the ongoing work of Mile High Connects to bring together people from different um, perspectives and persuasions and expertise to look at this, this core issue of how do we leverage the significant public investment in our transit infrastructure to have the greatest benefit for more of our citizens, to me is an, a brilliant example of the kind of work that needs to happen in communities so that it's not just one set of conversations happening in one place that then you run into that you can't implement, but it's really looking at creating long-term viable relationships that can be meaningful. Um, and that's really the a summary of what it is that we have been working on and how we're including those small businesses in the work. And thank you so much for letting us share and be a part. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here. So I put together this workshop with a few goals. I want um, to first say that it is important for everyone to understand what a transit corridor is because that's what uh, grounds the presentation that you will see and how we use that for job creation and to revitalize neighborhoods. Um, we also want to identify um, the low and moderate income communities, the challenges and the assets that exist here and how to use those assets to mitigate challenges and the importance of incorporating history and heritage in the discussions. Um, so that the cultural identity of those communities isn't lost. As was mentioned before, it is important to include the voice of the community in any development efforts. And also how to think of the transit corridor as a market to attract uh, businesses and how to build capacity to improve those transit corridors. So I'm with LISC, I run the LA office. Uh, LISC was founded in 1979 by the Ford Foundation and our work is to transform neighborhoods into healthy communities places where people want to work, do business, and raise children. Our model is to work with different organizations. We get capital, which we then reinvest into communities into, in the form of grants, loans, equity, and technical assistance so that these communities and the stakeholders there can build affordable housing so that they can revitalize their e uh, economies, um, create jobs, wealth creation, uh, improve their education, and create an overall healthier community. This is where LISC works. We have 30 urban uh, programs plus rural. 
In, uh, since 1980, we have invested approximately $13 billion, which has leveraged $38 billion. Now, how the LISC approach for transit-oriented development is that we use market information and assessments so that we can help communities understand their potential and so that they are better positioned to exercise uh, control over the, their economic future. We also use it to educate the community and businesses about market opportunities, which as um, many of you that work in low and moderate income communities uh, may know that sometimes that is a big gap. Um, and how to increase the capacity of this community. And a lot of times that includes a lot of the advocacy work that is necessary so that these communities can have a voice in the development. With this information, we suggest uh, strategies and starting points uh, so that they can revitalize their communities. And that can include uh, strategies such as how to use their community assets, which includes the heritage and history, um, as anchors to revitalize their communities, how to create jobs uh, for small businesses, how to use the opportunities that come with the building of light rail, and the real estate development, how to increase the capacity of businesses and developers to do technical assistance. As was mentioned already, um, we have also found that small businesses um, need a lot of technical assistance and so we provide that and real estate developers as well so we have technical assistance modules for both for small businesses as well as for uh, developers and all of this is to improve the customer choice of um, that is offered in the in the corridor and how to attract complementary businesses so the capacity building is um, part of the capacity building we do is to create a conversation so that transit agencies have a, an understanding of the community. So we have uh, developed um, plans for transit corridors, um, which introduce opportunities that may exist in the corridor and the market potential. Often we have seen that investors gravitate to areas that already have a lot of investment and that have proven themselves out and often overlook low and moderate income communities. So the market assessments that we do is so that we can show the market potential that exists. And so this increases attential, attention for um, prospects of around job creation and neighborhood revitalization as a whole. The, um, we work with a range of stakeholders, so it is not just the development community. A lot of the TOD efforts that exist seem to be around the, the development uh, of uh, real estate, but we also talk about what capital can be provided, what capital can we attract, what are some potential tenants, the um, neighborhood groups, and uh, last but not least, the uh, transit agencies that exist and that are already working there. So we work with cultural anchors that are, that are already there and um, conduct real estate analysis, highest and best use, we prepare designs, and this is uh, all for the benefit of the community so that, uh, again, so that the community voice can be heard and so that we can lay out a sustainable plan that grows the community economy while respecting the history and culture. So again, the voice of the community is very important so that um, while the values of, of the real estate increase and the um, services come in, we are not displacing people. Gentrification is good if it does not include um, displacement, so it depends on, on how you use that word. So why do we do this? Well, we have found that transit corridors are the backbone of communities, especially low and moderate income communities. It, um, it maintains the identity of these um, of the people and the place that live there. And it is usually the focal point um, that supports a lot of the businesses that are located there. And um, so improving the corridor means increased revenues for the businesses that are there, which then creates jobs. And uh, it also includes affordable housing and improving cultural assets and the preservation of cultural assets, which are usually places of historical significance. And it is access and appreciation to the cultural and historical places that are there. These are assets that are often overlooked, but can be really great anchors to um, increase the identity of place. Now, the work is, has a lot of challenges, some of which have already been mentioned. The, usually what we have found in the areas where we work is that um, the condition of the corridor is you know, not 
necessarily adequate for ready or ready for investment, and that includes vacant uh, properties or deteriorated properties. Usually we find that um, transit corridors are split into segments, either by freeways or major thoroughfares. So understanding where those are is very important because that will affect how you plan around the transit corridor. And uh, some of the challenges are inconsistent sidewalks, uh, lack of lighting, limited walkability, and the perception of crime, which can be a very, very big barrier. And sometimes it is only a perception, not real, but it is something that you should also plan around, community safety. And um, you know the perception of the community as a whole sometimes is a challenge. Around small businesses, um, as has been said, technical assistance is usually a, a big challenge, and that's because resources are thin and liquidity is lacking. And so technical assistance modules for businesses has to be a major component for these transit corridors. And if you're going to try to um, make sure that these small businesses are not displaced. Lack of brokerage, brokerage services is also another major challenge we have seen, and that's because the major brokerage firms want to service the big box retailers and don't really want to work with the small ones. And um, so traditional linkages between business and the rest of the corridor and, other, and the other big players is uh, some of the work that we usually have to do to make sure that, ev that the whole entire community is connected. And building ownership, that is also a very big challenge because a lot of the small businesses don't have leases. And once you start investing into a community and the community improves, a lot of times if um, the owners are not the same owners of the business, then you will see uh, a lot of displacement. So with all of that information, I'm gonna give you um, two examples of some of the work that we have done in Los Angeles. The first one is um, in the area of Little Tokyo. This is one of the examples of the work that we do. So this is, this is what I mentioned earlier, that we do market assessments. Um, this is a retail float analysis. And as you will see here, pretty much what this is saying, where the happy face is, is that in Little Tokyo, the majority of the purchasing and the revenues that are within that community come from people that do not live in the community. So this is an area where um, it's a Japanese area and a lot of the Japanese communities come into this area. So there are a lot of businesses catering to that community. Now, this is a good thing because as you can see, it is a very large number from which is the 288 that you see there. That is the amount from outsiders that are coming to the community. But at the same time, that makes it a very, very hot community. And uh, this is one of the areas where um, the um, Metro, which is the uh, transit agency in the area, wanted to put a regional connector which was going to connect many of the light rail systems. And um, as originally planned, uh, this eight city block um, community was going to lose approximately a third of its community through that regional connector. And so the work that we did with them included some uh, community organizing, which was necessary in order for um, the agency to learn about you know, the significance and identity of this community. So there was a lot of organizing that was done. And with that assistance, um, instead of losing a third of their community, only one city block was lost, and which is, which is the, um, where the regional connector is going to be. We are also working on investing heavily in their commercial corridor. And as you can see from this picture, this commercial corridor is, um, has a lot of their identity. It, it, uh, when people drive through there, people know that they are in Little Tokyo. So preserving that identity is very, very important. And so we're investing heavily in that. And again, the small businesses there, um, you know, part of what we're doing is also providing technical assistance in addition to the capital, the small business loans that we provide. Um, we've also done a lot of work on mixed-use real estate development. What we have found is that mixed-use uh, creates jobs because it usually has space on the first level that is um, commercial. And so um, since our goal is to create economic opportunities or to improve the economic vitality of these communities, uh, we do a lot of work in um, mixed-use development. The next example is with uh, the Coalition for Responsible Community Development. 
This is another example of the work that we do, the market assessments that we do. And this is another way of looking at the retail flow, very similar to the slide that had the very happy face. But the difference here is that this one shows that most of the spending power that exists in this community is actually leaking out. So as opposed to Little Tokyo, where most of the revenues are staying there and they even have other revenues from outside that are being spent there, this one is the opposite. They're losing a lot of it and a lot of that money is leaking out. So the strategy that we're using with them is, um, again, helping the small businesses there. We're trying to then uh, work with the community to attract businesses that are complementary so that the leakage that exists is reduced by bringing those businesses into their community. But in addition to that, um, we have invested heavily in um, a program that exists within that community to train local residents in uh, construction jobs. And that's because um, that will provide jobs and wealth creation to the community, to the residents that live in, the, in that community. We have also invested in a charter school. This is a community where the majority of the um, high school students were dropping out. So more than 50% were dropouts and hardly any of them were receiving um, a high school diploma. So we in, we're investing heavily in a charter school to ensure that there's more high school graduates. And last but not least, working with the, co the local community college so that those that are already going through the youth build program, which is the construction great trade program and finishing their high school diploma through the charter school can uh, then move on to receive a certificate in one of the construction trades. The construction program, which is the youth build, the charter school, are both located within uh, the community college. So it is a partnership that we have formed um, to make sure that we build that pipeline. We have also um, assisted this organization with the preservation of their historical assets. And so these are a couple of the examples. The Dunbar Hotel is a place where, during the years of segregation, this is the place where a lot of the actors and musicians used to stay because um, the downtown Los Angeles hotels would not allow for African Americans to stay in those hotels. So this is the place um, where they would stay. It had, um, of course, throughout the years, it, um, it had shut down. It was shut down for many, many years, and we helped rehabilitate this, um, this beautiful building, and um, it looks different now, of course, but, and now it has been reopened, and it is a senior home, senior housing project. The one at the bottom is the historic 28th YMCA. This was the only YMCA that would allow African Americans back in the segregation uh, days. So again, we helped them rehab this. And, and I point these out because these are the cultural assets that I mentioned earlier, where we can use these assets to help tell the story, the heritage of this community as a way of attracting more, um, more foot traffic into the area. Remember that I mentioned that part of what we're doing here is helping them attract um, complementary businesses. And so also using this historical assets together with that, we hope to change that so that the leakage is reduced. So as you can see from this uh, presentation, some of the job opportunities are around real estate development, uh, working with the transit agency and trade union so that a portion of those construction jobs become available to the community. Investing heavily in small businesses, um, and that can include the retail, which, which I showed here, but also manufacturing. Many of the cities have um, industry clusters, and so part of what we're doing is developing very specific um, training for uh, the job gaps that exist in, in, in manufacturing. And then also specific programs for the major employers. I didn't show that here, but part of the assessments also shows some of the larger employers um, that exist in these communities. And so I'll leave, I have this slide, but please ignore it for now because we're gonna leave questions for the end. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, well, um, I'm Andy Hesnes, and I, uh, I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I work in an organization called the Native American Community Development Institute. Um, and we are a community development intermediary. Um, we are an organization that was developed by the Native community um, really to um, 
come together, create a vision for the future of the Native community, and implement that vision um, moving forward into the future. Um, it's an organization designed by the community, um, and, and really I'm the only non-Native staff person at the organization, so it continues to be an organization of the community. Um, and with that sort of engagement and vision building, um, it's really created, uh, in a relatively short amount of time, a good platform uh, for the ability to um, uh, move a vision forward. So, um, and Part of that and what I'll be talking about today is a really specific project um, within the context of uh, the community in South Minneapolis. So um, you, uh, many of you may or may not be familiar, Minneapolis actually has uh, one of the larger native populations uh, in a city in the entire country, um, and South Minneapolis has the most concentrated, the densest uh, American Indian population in any uh, neighborhood in the country. Um, so we have this uh, unique opportunity um, within South Minneapolis um, to take um, the assets of the community and really create something that's uh, a destination and creates uh, some new economic opportunity. When you look um, across a lot of metrics, uh, the Native community tends to lag. It has a uh, remarkably large uh, health disparity, uh, educational attainment. Um, but there's, uh, at the same time, there's these challenges. There's also uh, a great amount of uh, promise. Um, so we're, uh, we're really working from that context. Um, so uh, the uh, majority of the community exists in South Minneapolis. And uh, this is near the uh, Hiawatha Line, which was a light rail line that opened in 2004. Um, this is a photo of the Franklin Station, um, one of the uh, busier stations on the line. Um, we estimate about 20,000 people a day pass by this station. Um, and it's, it's a really important um, center of the community and connection to the regional transportation system. Um, but when you walk outside the door of the transit station, this is what you see. Um, there's really nothing there. Um, and, and that's the situation we've faced uh, for a long time. Um, so when we talk about transit-oriented development and connecting communities uh, to the transit system, um, when this is the reality outside the station, um, we, we've got a challenge that we have to overcome. Um, and the, uh, the situation is, as you move forward, it doesn't get a lot better. Um, we've got a huge uh, highway underpass here. Um, and it continues to be uh, more or less vacant space. Um, and those buildings you see on the right side of the screen there, that's about a quarter mile from the transit station, and that's essentially the closest building or any structure we have uh, to the transit station. So when we're thinking about economic development, about connecting um, the uh, existing resources in the community to the transit station, um, we've got to figure out a way to bridge that gap. Um, and it's, it's bigger than just uh, transportation planning and community visioning. Um, we've got to start kind of taking stock of what steps we can take um, sooner than that. Um, so with that, um, you know, I've mentioned and Claudia touched on a lot, um, it really starts from a conversation about assets. Uh, the Native community is a really vibrant place. Um, and through uh, a lot of uh, organizing and, and visioning through our organization and previous organizations, we've, uh, we've created a vision for the community. Um, and, and when I say we, I mean the, the work that we've done. It, it really is, has bubbled out of the community and, and come from it. And uh, that's really shown in this document, the American Indian Community Blueprint, which we released in 2010. In concert with that was this concept of taking the assets of the community and making a destination within the metro region. Um, so what you see in this image is the um, inauguration of the American Indian Cultural Corridor, a cultural district linked to the light rail, um, showcasing the culture, the language, uh, the food of the Native community, and really welcoming the entire region into a conversation uh, about, um, about who Native people are in a real and authentic way, told by Native people, um, and uh, open to all. Um, and, and in addition to that, we also have a lot of uh, really latent assets in the community. Um, the Native community has a lot of craftspeople, people who make uh, products themselves, many out of their home. Um, but these are often really informal businesses. Um, we actually have a lot of people in the community who go sort of door to door um, selling beadwork or dream catchers or other products they make. Um, so we have all these um, skilled craftspeople in the community, um, but there's not a lot of outlet for that, and there's not a good way to connect that to um, the regional economy. Um, and the most important asset we really have is the community itself. The Native community, um, through uh, it, its own organizing and some of the work we've done, has um, created an organized uh, place where they can um, create and articulate a vision and then advocate for that. Um, and they really are what drives our ability to um, have a, uh, an agenda and move it forward uh, in partnership with the community. Um, 
so as we started to take all these different pieces together, um, we started to look at what, you know, what, what transit station we have here and how do we take advantage of these community assets and then the physical asset of, of space and land. Um, so we've got those 20,000 riders a day on the station, but they don't even really know that the native community is here. Um, so we proposed a project um, and called the Ampetu Washte Cultural Arts Marketplace. Ampetu Washte means good day in Dakota, one of the uh, regional languages in Minnesota. And we wanted to take the existing space in the community, that median space, publicly owned, and repurpose it, turn it into community space, create a place where uh, the native craftspeople in the community can sell their work, where we can have performance and language and uh, poetry readings, and create activity at that station area in a relatively low cost way that starts to encourage people to come into the community, takes advantage of the transit system, um, and um, really creates uh, some economic opportunity within the community with the hope that over time that will then catalyze development. Um, one of the things we haven't seen at this station is really real estate development activity and some of that is a result of the infrastructure. Uh, so as we're trying to figure out how we can have a stronger presence uh, for the native community and the economy, um, looking at how we can catalyze some of that development opportunity um, really is going to be a, a piece of that. Um, so the project was, um, was funded and um, we actually had, as a community group, uh, had to go out and find the money ourselves. Um, the city and the county had some plans on the boards, but they hadn't allocated any dollars to it. And over um, many years, it's been about nine years since the Hiawatha line opened, um, nothing had really come about. So um, we went after some funds and got funded by a group called Art Place, which is a national creative placemaking um, group. And with that, we've been able to start development of it. So uh, this is just from uh, this, this fall. We started construction on, uh, on that median space. and. Um, been able to start transforming uh, this this unused space in the middle of the community into something um, that will uh, hopefully be a benefit. Um, so this is the design that really came out of this community process, this community visioning for uh, rethinking the space. We've got um, this ability to have artist vendor tents, food trucks, a stage, um, and build some stronger community connections. Um, and this is what the project starts to look like as we implement it over time, uh, really connecting uh, this stretch of community that's, that's disconnected um, with all these other uh, possible amenities. So um, just a couple uh, sort of lessons learned and, and uh, takeaways from this. Um, just putting the transit station in a, a low-income community or a community of color, uh, cultural community, does not necessarily uh, ensure that people will benefit from it. There's been some research at the Uni University of Minnesota that um, it's, uh, the Hiawatha Line's increased access to jobs that hasn't happened in the native community. Um, it really uh, takes um, being uh, sensitive to where the community is at, what the needs are, what the opportunities are. Um, we have to build connections. So in some cases, this is physical, but it's also organizational. We've done a lot of work um, to build the relationships with Hennepin County, with the city of Minneapolis, um, with other community groups around um, to create this infrastructure where we can um, create space for people, but also work on training and entrepreneurial um, development that will support this um, physical space we're creating. Um, and we need to broadly engage the community. This project has bubbled up from engagement, from visioning with the community, and then the entire design process has been in contact with the community, um, including their ideas and thoughts. Um, so really taking the skills and assets of the community, putting them into action. Um, and another piece is just turning challenges into opportunities. Um, this uh, median space was a really a barrier. It made the street wider. It made the space more uh, sort of inhospitable to people coming through. Um, we took that and turned it on its head and said, what can we do to make this a community amenity? And turning that into public space in a plaza is one way we can do that. Um, and uh, looking to unlikely partners, I didn't expect to be working with the Bike Coalition and the Sierra Club and some neighborhood organizations, but we found a lot of partners in some strange places, and uh, they've all been uh, really key allies in moving an agenda forward. So so uh, with that, I um, invite you all to Minneapolis next year for the revolution and come see our plaza. Thanks. Uh, well, he's getting that ready. Um, the basic premise of what I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, starts from the introduction that I read about the session of transit investments and jobs. And um, uh, our lessons are similar to what Andrew was talking about. Uh, hopefully, it does not make Bear, Papa Bear, Mama Bear, uh, we've got examples of where uh, we have mind-boggling job creation without thinking about transit at all. Uh, um, 
I'm thinking about Andrew's presentation. We've also got neighborhoods where we did the most amazing transit investment, and boy, had we had that thinking and that uh, group together in advance and integrated uh, where uh, the community wanted to go, uh, we would be far better where we are. We've taken all that learning and tried to put it into how do you bring all the players that have leverage over the eventual development of that uh, transit investment in that neighborhood and have them working with the transit agency in advance uh, to try to accelerate the job creation. That's essentially what I'm uh, going to talk about. Um, and I will try to do that uh, quickly. So, oh, we didn't get the South Lake Union. Here we go. So just brief context. Um, I'm going to be talking about South Lake Union, uh, which is uh, right a few blocks south of here. Uh, Amazon is building 6 million square feet of commercial space over the next decade in South Lake Union. Imagine that. Uh, and there's another 3 million square feet in uh, master use permitting uh, on top of that, uh, 3,000 residential units. So that's right here in the core city. We're going to be talking uh, about a tunnel station down south which is a completed light rail station in a neighborhood probably not too dissimilar, uh, if different ethnically, but uh, demographically to uh, the one your previous speakers have been talking about. And then we'll move up to the university district, which is uh, uh, prospected to open in four years. Um, and I promise you I will try to do this very quickly. I gave you some stats about South Lake Union. And um, from 95 to today, uh, no, from 95 to four years ago, there are over maybe 15,000 new jobs in a narrow neighborhood. And that neighborhood is literally from here to here, from here to here. Um, 18,000, uh, no, 15,000 new jobs. Uh, that's two-year-old information. There'll be another 10,000 in five years. Um, that didn't happen randomly. The city is building a new substation. The city created a park. The city did a major land swap with a major property owner. We have rezoned. We have amended the International Fire Code to allow labs above third floor. Um, I can go on and on and on about the things the city to do placemaking, but now it's really hard to get in, in and out of that place already. Um, you know, the bio, it was, it was built from an economic perspective. How would, what, what is an economic driver that you would create a neighborhood around? And our life sciences and IT community said, well, let's do it around um, residential, commercial, retail, around those types of jobs. Now they're saying, I can't get in and out in the afternoon. Um, we've got all these cars that are competing to get out. So we had billions of dollars worth of transit investments planned and made over the last decade, but no one even thought to think about what's going to happen here. So from an economic development perspective, I'm saying, OK, market's going to drive. If people really want to locate here, we're going to have to figure out alternative means. But our major transit investments aren't going to be a significant solution to that. Um, uh, I, I, so this is, um, you know, nearby is the Gates Foundation. There's the light, there's the streetcar we put in, but it only goes six blocks. Uh, you see some major construction, and that's a park there down on the, the lower, the lower um, left. The premise being amazing job growth, very little thinking about transit long term and what that job growth and that neighborhood creation needed. Uh, so this literally will be free market. Will people continue to come and find alternative means, or will this vision for where it's going collapse because we didn't think about how mobility from a transit perspective? Um, this is our Othello Station, Southeast Seattle, uh, demographically one of the most challenged in the city. Uh, they often call it uh, probably the most uh, uh, integrated neighborhood in the country when you look at uh, you know one-third of African descent, one-third of, uh, of Asian descent, and the remaining third Hispanic and white. So lots of cultures there. Uh, we did state-of-the-art redevelopment of every piece of infrastructure in here, undergrounding wires, building high-capacity light rail, reconnecting transit, um, investing several hundred, maybe half a billion dollars in the redevelopment of a major uh, housing authority. And um, we've got uh, acres. These three parcels are in public ownership and acres of undeveloped land uh, next to um, a 
about the same amount of private development land that's still sitting in parking lots. The private sector market wants to go to uh, either subsidize affordable housing or really cheap housing with no commercial on the ground. That's not going to set the direction for what this neighborhood needs in 10 to 20 years. Um, and the public sector market hasn't gotten it together. The, the transit agency kind of rushed through and said, we got to get the hole in the ground and the, and the light rail through. We can't have time to think long term. This is a dramatic missed opportunity. Uh, we're having to go and try to recreate and see if the public sector can think differently and subsidize some development that will set the market. What did not happen was engaging uh, all the people that have levers of uh, control. That's the property owners, it's the business owners, it's the, when I say business, it's really nonprofit and for profit. Churches are for profit, institutions, and others. Um, I'm going to go to the university district. We're opening uh, light rail and redesigning a lot of that in about 2016. And what our office has done from an economic development perspective is we're not going to allow South Lake Union or Othello to occur again. So um, Andres Mantilla here, if you want to raise your hand, Andres uh, is in our, we brand it only in Seattle. And what we do is we invest hundreds of thousands of dollars really on the community organizing, uh, bringing um, major um, property and community interests, all property owners, all existing business owners, all nonprofit social service agencies. In this instance, we have the advantage of having the University of Washington nearby and asking from a job from a housing and from a retail uh, recruitment and retention perspective, what do we want to see here in five to ten years? Let's put the plan together, let's build the organizational structure to realize it, and let's start telling the city and the transit agency how uh, all the different uh, aspects of the city and the transit agency are going to be involved in making this happen. Uh, so um, uh, that we're calling it our university. Uh, here's just um, I won't go into the details, but there's a lot of land ownership here that's around, uh, some of it in shared private sector ownership. The University of Washington has a lot of other ownership. Um, and here's essentially uh, the plan that emerged. Um, uh, what are some of the streetscape uh, and visibility uh, we want to create? Um, uh, urban design alleyways, uh, we are looking at clean and safe, someone talked about that, expanding a business improvement area uh, that would uh, deal with uh, both safety, civility, and with uh, cleanup. Uh, Andres helped me out with a couple other things we're doing. There's engagement of the light rail agency around what's going to happen at the station. Yeah, we sort of So the result of this is the University of Washington in, has kind of moved from ignoring this area to investing about $300,000 a year in the successful formation and execution of this strategy. They're thinking about South Lake Union that I described to you as full, so startup and mid-capitalized companies need a place. How do we connect our commercialization efforts and our basic research to some of the office and um, uh, professional uh, work that needs to happen here. We have a light rail station. What are our kind of uh, professor and worker needs in terms of uh, housing and how do we get the uh, private sector market? There's been a lot of synergy uh, in terms of how the university and how the city um, organize its investments to help the community accomplish. And quite frankly, it's been a bit of a headbutting with the transit agency. Many of you, I assume this is a transit uh, audience. It's, I get it. it. You have really hard work to do. You, you need to uh, engineer and b bring solutions to bear. Uh, what we're doing is asking a little bit more than usual to suspend that bottom line immediate towards what is going to be the best return on investment in five to ten years. And I think there's a really healthy, healthy tension between the type of hard community organizing around accomplishable goals and objectives in the next five years and pushing the transit agency to think differently so we don't have uh, Othello or your station where this is amazing stuff that we have to come after the fact and uh, Jerry rig. So I will end there. I'm trying to uh, make sure there's enough time for discussion, but um, uh, within those um, Within those bookends, we've created a program that's trying to organize uh, those 
uh, interests that have much at stake over the success of the transit investment for a long-term economic development plan at the neighborhood level. And um, uh, at least in the university district and a couple other neighborhoods, it's bearing fruit for the long term. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I welcome you all to Seattle. Thank you, Steve. Um, and, and I guess maybe in, by way of introduction when we started earlier and talking about transit and land use planning for Steve's benefit, how many of you in the room are from transit properties? Okay, a couple. Yeah. Um, business or economic development groups? Okay. Um, I think that one of the things that's unique about Rail Evolution is the fact that we get such a broad spectrum of participation from people who are involved in all the different aspects of things that are going on. I want to thank the four of you again because I think you brought some really unique perspectives to the things that a lot of us do on a regular basis. And obviously, um, we find that when we, we all have the most success when we bring other people to the table that we wouldn't have necessarily thought of. And Andy, when you're talking about bringing the the Bike Coalition and the Sierra Club that you wouldn't have thought to be partners in your project, an example of that. Um, I'm curious though, um, Mickey, you made a comment in your presentation about small businesses um, and the number of uh, new jobs that they've created in Colorado and the research you did with funding from J.P. Morgan. And of course, we're also, some of us familiar with American Express has started a program the last couple of years to encourage on certain days of the year shopping at small businesses. Um, are there other banks or large institutions that the others of you have had experience with who are really beginning to focus on and emphasize the value of small business and what it means for their communities? I know Citibank is, is uh, interested in that as well. Um, you know, all of the major banks are looking at job creation and working with small businesses, looking at economic development more closely than before. I think previously a lot of the large banks were concentrated more on the real estate development. So it's good to see that now they're looking at economic development more closely. Okay. Great. I'll just quickly add, if I could. Yeah. Um, anybody who does not use the Kaufman Foundation and their work uh, ought to check it out. Um, amazing um, dedication to entrepreneurship and understanding uh, what it does and how to do it. Um, the other thing that I will say is I always amend it's not small businesses, at least from our experience, it's young businesses. Um, so, and young businesses are typically small. Um, so I, we've prioritized both in immigrant refugee populations and minority populations as well as general. How do you focused on the fuel of new entrepreneurship, um, which really constantly refreshes. In some of these neighborhoods, you really want to protect existing institutions and or businesses that have been around a long time. But a restaurant that's been here 30 years is probably not going to create a lot of new jobs. You want to keep them. Um, so that, that's my take. Look at the Kaufman Foundation and really focus on new formation, because um, that's where you see, at least in our area, a lot of the job growth. There are questions out here? Yes. And uh, we're on being video, so I'm going to ask you to use the microphone so they have you on the record. Uh, my question's for Andrew. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on um, how that Franklin Station project is being financed and what type of outreach activities uh, perhaps uh, you're, you're doing? Yeah, so it's, um, it's been kind of a long process. We, uh, we started doing visioning um, really before there were any dollars. Um, and what, what started to bubble up was um, something that was really centered around artists and uh, the creative community that existed. Um, and at, at that point, there's been, uh, there was a grant opportunity that was announced by the Art Place uh, Foundation, which is a collaboration of national funders. Um, and it, it aligned really closely with um, a lot of the things that were already bubbling up from uh, conversations in the community. Um, so we were able to um, bring that a grant in uh, for $435,000 to do the majority of the hard construction. Um, and I think tying into the other uh, piece, um, 
about uh, engagement, um, we were then able to take that grant and go to the, um, the Twin Cities region has a quarters of opportunity, which is uh, community engagement around um, transit quarters, and there's uh, some other business development elements, but there was a specific grant program tied to engagement. Um, and we were able to leverage that construction grant into getting some engagement dollars to really do a robust uh, visioning process specific to this project. Um, we'd done more corridor um, engagement for a number of years before that, but, but this allowed us to have a really um, good process um, where we were able to sit down and, and invite in the native community, um, other neighborhood organizations and community members um, on both sides because one of the things um, that may or may not be obvious is this is the border of two neighborhoods and there's two communities that are completely isolated by this uh, transit station in this area. So um, what we're trying to do is really uh, use this opportunity both in the physical infrastructure but the engagement process to bring these neighborhoods back together and connect them more strongly. Um, so we were able to, to do that piece as well. like to ask, an, I guess, a question along the line of involvement engagement as well, um, because uh, Mickey, Claudia, and Andy all talked about engagement using resources in this process, and then Steve obviously talked about the fact of the examples where it hasn't happened. And given when I asked for the uh, show, the raise of hands here, so few transit folks in terms of transit properties in the room, I guess one question that I'd ask is, is have you found transit agencies to be a willing participant or wanting your engagement in this process earlier to help address and get this communities, these communities involved early on so that you don't face the problems that Steve is facing further down the road? <laughs> Would you like to answer that? <laughs> um, so what we have seen is that transit agencies come into a community um, without directly trying to engage the community. And so that's why we felt it was important for us to help communities uh, understand their markets so that they can then have a voice in the development of their own communities. And that's because, not that I feel the transit agencies are doing it to be malicious, of course, that's not what I'm saying. It's just, it's, it's you know, they're, they're coming in and, 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 and they have a plan. But um, we felt it was important for the transit agencies to also acknowledge that there are, that there is a, another voice that they should be listening to. So I don't know if that answers your question. It's well, a fair answer. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that now that you've been brave and diplomatic <laughs> in your way of speaking about it. I think, um, the, the dynamic that I, I see happening I in in my place is, um, <laughs> right, they have a plan. They have a plan. They have the funding to do what they're doing. They have the authority to do what it is that they're doing. And I, I think there's, there's just a serious gap in understanding what it actually means for residents and businesses to be interacting with the transportation authority and, and you know, the buses that are in their community. And so that's very, it's very reactive and not very proactive. Um, so even, you, now it's on, even conversations that I've had um, where I've been advocating for that transit is actually not affordable in Denver. It costs $5 a day if you wanna be a person who is riding the bus to and from work and I can afford, my car costs a lot less than $5 a day to operate. And there, so there are people, you know, you, we have, we have two different kinds of riders, those who um, have access because of their privilege to um, transit passes that they don't have to pay out of pocket for. And then we have people who have no other option and their only option is to spend $5 a day to try to get somewhere. And if you start to have that, I've only, now this has only happened a couple of times, but when I've tried to have that conversation with people um, who are in positions of authority at our regional transportation district, they don't even, it's never even occurred to them that maybe 250 a ride is too expensive for people who don't have means or even people who are in that middle range of they don't have passes and they can sort of afford it but why would you set that up so i think there's a serious gap in in my place of understanding from our transportation authority that um, this is actually about public transit and we want to <laughs> We want to make it accessible to everyone and it isn't the engineering of the infrastructure is absolutely needed but it isn't enough 
to have it be something that is truly accessible and um, usable by people within our community. And I think there are, you know, I see places, there are certain places in, in Colorado that have somehow negotiated um, neighborhood-based passes where everyone who's a property owner that lives there is paying a little bit in their property tax towards everyone having access to the transit which I, as a property owner and a business person in my community, I would love to do something like that, but there isn't an opening for that conversation. So they've made that accessible to some people, but then for whatever reasons, it doesn't work for them. And, and there isn't that engagement process. So I think there's a big opportunity for us to do more of that work strategically to say, we've already been investing in this. You're already operating this. How do we make sure that this really is accessible to more people in our community? I just try to add quickly um, I um, the transit agencies have really difficult jobs and in this area it's been 30 years trying to wade through all the objections to investing in public transit so I completely get and I'm sympathetic when to them, community engagement means let's go out and have a whole bunch of neighborhoods scream about things that I can't, I can't accomplish that knock me off my path. I think that's, and so what we're trying to do is say we're going to organize um, meaningful community-based um, groups that you can work with that can actually execute and follow up on strategies that will help. Uh, improve ridership and the attractiveness of your stations. The quid pro quo is you're going to take the time to listen to them and actually do a little investment. And there's some tension around that, but we've found um, some success in early going in organizing that quid pro quo. So I, I want to be respectful that they have some of the hardest jobs in the world. And if we do our work and make it easier for them, then we're going to require them to behave differently. So that's kind of, to me, the value exchange. Um, and I'll just add a little bit. Um, in the Twin Cities, um, when uh, Hiawatha Line, which is the line that our station was on, was the first line built. Um, and my impression was uh, the transit agency didn't really do a great job of engaging um, with a lot of the communities that were along the line when that line was planned. Um, there were some neighborhood uh, organization driven plans, but that is one voice in the community, but not necessarily a fully representative voice. Um, I think we're actually doing a better job. Um, I think there's always room for improvement, but uh, with the central corridor planning that's going on in the Twin Cities. Um, but the challenge is how do we go back to those stations on those earlier lines? And uh, I think the challenge we're facing in the Twin Cities that, to an extent is um, there's starting to be more resources around transit planning for new infrastructure, but looking at the existing system we have, how is the transit agency better engaging with community groups? Um, I invited the um, outreach staff for Metro Transit uh, to our office and talked a lot about the cultural corridor and the work we're doing at the Hiawatha station, and um, I asked um, the woman if, if we could come and give a presentation to the transit agency, and she looked at me kind of funny and said, gosh, we always go out and give presentations. We've never had anyone come to us and give a presentation. Mm -hmm. So. We've got to find a way where um, not just the new infrastructure, but also the existing systems we have create this conversation between community and uh, the transit agencies. Um, so we're working on that on the community side, and I think if we can keep pushing our uh, you know, public agency partners to do that better, um, that can be um, you know, potentially a win-win. Great, thank you. Is there anybody else? I just had one question. Is there a, a good source um, or specific case studies you could cite of the, the you know, positive impact of uh, transit, uh, transit road development on small business? It's such an important thing when you're developing in these context. I mean, one of the reasons why we're doing this work in Denver is because there. As far as, as far as I know, there isn't. Um, it's, it's just, it just hasn't necessarily been part of the, co the conversation. And often when people um, who aren't small business people are talking about community impacts around small business, they just make a lot of assumptions. Uh, and so um, I know that there, there's definitely work happening in communities to be inclusive, um, but I, no. And I was thinking that it w one of the things that would be really meaningful because 
Denver is, is being more thoughtful and intentional as a community through these collaborations about, well, what is the impact, not just on you know, people who live here via housing prices, but also on existing businesses. Um, I think it will be interesting to see as we open up more station areas and more time passes, what is it that we weren't predicting? What can we learn from that? And hopefully we'll have the opportunity to be able to express and communicate some of those lessons to more people, um, which is an interesting opportunity for Denver being such a young city when it comes to our light rail. In, the, in Los Angeles, um, we created a, a partnership with the city of LA uh, based on their consolidated plan. And to my knowledge, that is the first consolidated plan that includes place, it's, it's place-based, includes jobs, includes affordable housing, economic uh, development all in one. And so the work that we're doing there is really to, to um, it's an overlay of the consolidated plan. Historically, transit-oriented development has been around housing, unfortunately. And, and yeah, you're right in that, um, you know, the conversations around economic development are newer. But, um, and that's why we're doing this work. But, um, you know, maybe the consolidated plan of the city of Los Angeles is a good uh, place to start. I would love to find that study if anybody can find it. I will, <laughs> I will tell you, um, this is anecdotally, we're extending a streetcar through our international, Chinatown International District that goes through Little Saigon up to Capitol Hill, which is the densest neighborhood west of Chicago, north of San Francisco. So it's a really, great connection and a lot of the Vietnamese business owners who also have businesses in near Othello are now saying transit doesn't mean jobs transit doesn't mean good business it means anti so we're having to actually overcome among that population in the small business community because of the way we uh, executed Othello the belief that transit is actually damaging and we don't want to change things so um, <coughs> that's really another example of the impetus for we really got you know we should have started this is another example with that Vietnamese business community uh, around what are the strategies that we're going to produce that will allow you to expand your markets um, uh, I love the work that you're doing there, there could be all kinds of great things around the asset of you know you don't have money to go to Saigon come to the little Saigon here uh, um, thinking of streetscape and marketing and all kinds of things um, but that's a, just such an important point that I don't think any of the players have spent time thinking about how to do it well and then how to how to inform people. Um, and just really briefly, I, I don't know a lot about it, but um, in, on the Central Corridor in the Twin Cities, um, uh, the Central Corridor Funders Collaborative has started um, collecting data. We're still in the construction phase of that line, um, but they are uh, looking at small business data throughout the construction period, and I believe they're going to keep con uh, keep collecting that data for a number of years after the line opens. So um, over time, that will start to create a picture of the impact uh, prior to the transit investment through construction and then after construction on um, small business uh, openings, closings, um, some of the economic data. Um, so that's going to um, hopefully uh, lead to some of that information you're looking for. Okay, great. Yes. Hi, I um, also work in the uh, Twin Cities region and on the Central Corridor. And just to add to what you're saying, Andy, that um, the the reason the Funders Collaborative is doing that is because the data doesn't yeah. exist. And if we looked at some national studies, and the only thing that they could come up with, um, and this was the Volpe Institute, um, uh, that looked at transportation impacts on small businesses was a small town in Yellowstone National Park. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's what we have in terms of research and to understand the dynamics. And so I, I think this is a, a really important area to continue to gather data and to share information, you know, across the country. And actually, um, by way of a plug, I guess, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., for those of you who are interested, uh, there's a panel with uh, Richard Manson from LISC uh, in New York and a woman by the name of Kimber Lanning from Phoenix. Um, Kimber runs a uh, small business advocacy group called Local First Arizona. It's the, small, or the largest small business advocacy group of its type in the country. Um, she is a... Uh, she will describe herself as the spitfire of small business economic development um, and is really focused on 
the idea that in the absence of the research that you were just asking about, kind of creating her own in terms of the things that she's done to work with small businesses around transit in Phoenix um, to help them build and gain employment um, without necessarily having the support of the communities that they thought they'd have to do that. Yeah, we've had to do our own market assessments for every community too. Yeah, because of the lack of data. I didn't hear your whole presentation. I'm sorry if this uh, this is already covered, but I guess in this realm, I'm just curious on the on the housing side around transit quarters. There's been a lot of work and policy tools in terms of trying to stabilize neighborhoods, inclusionary zoning, um, things you can do even though it's hard, you know, in terms of gentrification, displacement. Are there things from either your experience or on the small business side? What, what, because it seems like it's a very similar problem, right? You create value, uh, land value rises, people can't afford rents. It's the same thing whether you're in residential or you're in commercial. And I'm just curious, a, the experience, and B, what kind of intervention is anybody trying or could you try on the small business side to try to not have things flip over so much? So um, part of what we're doing, and yeah, you're right, um, you know, increase in values of properties is a good thing. Um, um, Different income brackets is a good thing. I mean, that's part of revitalizing a community. The bad thing is displacement of the people that are there, so and or the businesses. So our activities are for to try to minimize those negative effects. And so what we're doing is providing a lot of technical assistance to small businesses. And um, as was mentioned earlier, there are a lot of programs for capital, but even those programs cannot deploy that capital because the, the small businesses just don't have the capacity to take on a loan or they don't have the capacity to even prepare an application. So we're doing a lot of technical assistance on the small business side and also working with um, the small businesses to help them understand the importance of a lease or a good lease. It, a lot of them may have a lease, but the lease itself leaves a lot to be asked. And so those are some of the interventions that we're doing around the small business side. I would invite you to read, if you haven't, Harvard and Berkeley did groundbreaking research on social mobility. Uh, I think it was released this summer. There's an August article in the New York Times. Really fascinating what they found. <coughs> I, it's my word, but it's connection. And one of the connections is the more we can do to integrate um, low, middle, and upper incomes, uh, that more than anything has a value. Some of the other interesting social networks connections, people involved in churches or otherwise, and one that came out after the New York Times article was uh, actually transit. When people were in neighborhoods that they lost their job where there was easy access to other employment centers, it didn't require two hours of driving in a car, um, so my takeaway on this is um, um, we often have the wrong discussion in, do, um, in Othello. There's a lot of worry about gentrification. Um, from, a, from that research, the, pr the strategy ought to get as many people of middle and upper income levels living in that neighborhood as possible. Uh, without, you know, we have public housing there without just, without, um, um, watering down the number of subsidized and available units and looking at our wealthy neighborhoods and saying, how do we create opportunities for low and middle? That's ought to, we ought to be looking at integration across all neighborhoods. We tend to have these arguments in low-income neighborhoods that this can't change. Uh, we have to keep, uh, at least the way it plays out in Seattle, we have to keep the, um, the income demographic, not necessarily the racial demographic, but we have to keep the input demographic similar. I think that is not a strategy towards social mobility. And we have to broaden our thinking around looking across the whole landscape. So my argument, and the one we're having, is let's get as much as possible middle and higher income subsidized housing to create those neighborhoods in Othello to uh, create as much attractiveness to them. And then let's look at Laurelhurst, where Bill Gates grew up, and say, how do we create uh, middle and lower income housing there? <coughs> so 
the, the research on social mobility is starting to emerge, and it's really fascinating how you would design communities. So I would add, y your question is, is fundamental to the project that we're doing right now in the Sun Valley neighborhood. Um, and what's been great about the work of um, this collaborative, Mile High Connects, is that um, it started as a as a group of foundation partners and social justice organizations, and they've been able to build um, relationships so that now people from the Office of Economic Development are actually participating in the conversation, which they weren't doing before. I, it's still a question for me what how that might translate into action and how our Office of Economic Development is deploying their resources. So um, so that's a question. There's a question. Um, the way that we're doing that work because of this neighborhood and the opportunity for development and just the the partners that are available that is creating this pretty big opportunity for the community. Um, lots of organizations have been going in and surveying and doing outreach to the people who live there. They've been surveyed to death. Um, <laughs> and so that's part of the challenge and the problem is there's so much community engagement attempts that people are now like, really, you're gonna ask me the same questions? We just had this conversation. But on the business side, the 200 firms that are located in this neighborhood, no one talks to them about what it is that they actually need for their businesses to be successful. No one says, okay, we have 15 firms that are doing construction um, in this particular area. What are their unique business needs? And how? what are the opportunities for us to create new businesses or to expand businesses that are working specifically with those existing companies? So yeah, maybe they don't create new jobs themselves, but they working together using their, their collaborative um, uh, capacity and, and, and economic capacity can actually create other economic opportunity. So that's not how economic development strategy typically is working right now. And there's a definite opening through the Denver Office of Economic Development specifically in saying, all right, go talk to those businesses, because that's our perspective as Mile High Business Alliance, is maybe we should actually talk to the real business owners themselves. And then let's see what is going to come out of it. And it, it will be interesting to see what the findings are. I mean, we've been talking with them about, well, what are you going to do when your rent goes up because of how, because of the changes that are coming up? And some of them um, are committed to staying, and they're doing the work now to try to buy their properties that they're that they are a part of. And some of them are are they know that they're going to leave, and they don't have an investment in that specific neighborhood. So I think for us right now, we're just trying to understand how the businesses are perceiving this. And then um, I think there are. There are interesting opportunities that I get excited about. There's a, a group of um, um, people that are that have done a lot of community work that approached me recently and said, because we're doing some crowdfunding work in my uh, in my network, and they said, what if we could create investment opportunities for individuals that live in our community to help local businesses purchase the buildings that they're operating inside of? And if I could figure out, and, and I know there are people who are working on related or similar problems, but I think if we could figure out some of those mechanisms so that it isn't just about the existing property owners and real estate developers and big bankers who are able to play in this space, but it's actually community members saying, you know what, this 30-year-old restaurant, really important to me, and I want to participate in investing and having them be here for 30 more years. Um, and for me, when we get to those problems of ownership and long-term capacity and, and how we engage business owners in those problems, um, then we're really doing the work of creating long-term economic resiliency. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, listen, I'd like to thank all of you for staying past 5.30 um, today. <laughs> really appreciate the time that the four of you have spent with us. And I think that, you know, for all of us, what's really important to remember is, is no matter what we do as we go through this process, we need to reach out early, engage the people who are going to be affected. Because as Claudia said early on, gentrification is good, but not when it means displacement. Thank you. I love you, Claudia.